Okay, so I'll just get started. Um, thank you for coming today to the talk. My name is David Cho and I'm one of the CCFP M residents at Western. And today I'm hoping to talk to you about hypothermia. And my supervisor for this presentation was Dr. Guella. I wanted to start by saying I have no conflicts to declare. And also a thank you to Dr. Coella for his support and guidance. And I also want to say thank you for, uh, to Dr. Anderson uh, for giving me the case that I'll be discussing today, as well as giving me his insights and experience about the care of hypothermic patients. So the objectives for today's talk are to talk about the diagnosis and management of hypothermic patients, to discuss the considerations for termination of resuscitation in hypothermic patients, and lastly, to consider modifications to resuscitation in hypothermic patients. Uh, to start with the case, this is a case from a few years ago at LHSC, so some people in the audience may have been involved or heard of it. Uh, I wanted to mention that some of the details of the case have been modified or admitted just to facilitate the presentation. So AK is a 28-year-old female patient who was involved in an MVC rollover on the highway. It was a cold winter night and the roads were very slippery. Unfortunately, when her car slid off the highway, it rolled over and landed upside down in a ditch filled with cold water. Uh, you can see the illustration in the bottom left. It was stuck between a concrete barrier and the ditch, and so the car, uh, the, the car doors could not be opened. Thankfully, a witness saw the car fall off the highway and called for help immediately. And even though, but even though the help arrived quickly, the extrication uh, was very difficult because of the positioning of the car. It took approximately 25 minutes for the patient to be extricated because it required a tow truck to come pull out the car from the ditch before uh, the patient could be removed. In that time, the patient was submerged under uh, freezing water for about 25 minutes. Once the patient was extricated, she was found to be VSA with uh, fixed dilated pupils, cold pale skin, and a stiff body. So before talking further about the case, I wanted to talk about hypothermia for a little bit, uh, starting with the definition. For primary or accidental hypothermia, it's described to happen when heat production in an otherwise healthy person is overcome by the stress of excessive cold. And this is slightly different from secondary hypothermia, which is secondary to either uh, medical illness, trauma, advanced age, intoxication, or malnutrition, and can even occur in warm environments. The focus of today's talk will be on primary hypothermia, but of course it's important to note that uh, it's often complicated by secondary causes, because very rarely you have isolated primary hypothermia. It's not a very common presentation, especially in North America, only about 100 deaths per year in Canada or 1,300 deaths per year in the US are attributed to hypothermia. Some risk factors that contribute include advanced age, alcohol, or other uh, recreational drug use, homelessness, exposures, and underlying medical illnesses. This is a figure uh, from Statistics Canada and Toronto Public Health that illustrates the deaths attributable attributable to hypothermia in Canada between 2007 and 2011. And as you can see, increased age is a major risk factor, and overall the numbers are very low uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s. The diagnosis of hypothermia should be fairly simple by measuring a temperature. The best measure of temperature is with an esophageal probe, as illustrated in the picture, about uh, that's in the lower third of the esophagus because it's the best place to approximate cardiac temperature. The temperature measured this way can be falsely elevated uh, due to certain in interventions you may do, such as wormed ventilation. Most patients, if they're not sedated and intubated, don't tolerate esophageal probes, so um, this, an acceptable second best is usually the rectal probe. And rectal probes should be inserted about 15 centimeters deep as well uh, in order to provide as accurate of a core temperature as possible. The main classification system for hypothermia breaks it down by temperature. These aren't hard, fast rules, but most patients in uh, stage one, between 32 to 35 degrees, are going to be conscious and shivering. In stage two, between 28 to 32 degrees, their level of consciousness may be impaired, and often they'll have stopped shivering at this point. In stage three, between 24 to 28 degrees, most patients are unconscious, but vital signs are usually present. 
whereas in stage four below 24 degrees, most patients uh, will be VSA. Hypothermia makes the cardiac membranes very unstable and arrhythmogenic. Uh, so two things like BFib and BTAC that cause the arrest. And instability or arrest are possible anywhere starting from uh, 32 degrees and under, but the chances of it go up significantly with lower temperatures. Atrial fib is another very common uh, arrhythmia with temperatures below 32, but you, if it's an isolated finding, then it's usually not very worrisome. So as with all patients, uh, the priorities of management start with ABCs and IVO2 monitors. Hypothermia, as we mentioned, is not, an often, not often an isolated diagnosis. So doing a good primary and secondary surveys to look for things like infection and trauma is very important. During the exposure part of the survey, uh, you wanna make sure that the wet clothing is removed and that the patient is dried. And you want to start treating secondary illnesses as soon as possible, such as sepsis and hypoglycemia. Some considerations for management include limiting patient activity and stimulation because this can increase the risk of iatrogenic uh, ventricular fibrillation because of the cardiac instability from hypothermia. Of course, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't do necessary things like intubation. It's more referring to uh, taking care with certain things like if you're placing a central line, you should take extra care not to let the guide wire touch the heart and irritate it. Peripheral pulses can be hard to palpate if the patient is very cold and due to the vasoconstriction, so ultrasound can be a good adjunct for pulse checks. Fluid resuscitation is also often necessary because uh, most patients are volume depleted because of cold diuresis, which happens because of a hypothermia-induced vasoconstriction that reduces the release of ADH. Moving on to more specific management, at stage one between 32 to 35 degrees, passive rewarming with warm blanket and warm fluids uh, PO is often adequate. And if the patient is awake enough, then uh, doing activity can help as well. For patients in stage two or three between 24 to 32 degrees, as long as they're stable, you wanna use active rewarming with non-invasive and minimally invasive methods, including using a bear hugger, using warm humidified oxygen, and warm IV fluids around 40 degrees Celsius. Once patients uh, are below 24 degrees or either unstable or arrested, that's when you want to start invasive rewarming. ECMO and cardiopulmonary bypass are preferred methods of re rewarming if they're available. Active resuscitation, including CPR and ACLS, should be employed as necessary and the airway should be secured. If you happen to be in a center uh, where ECMO or cardiopulmonary bypass are not options, or the patient is not uh, eligible for those for various reasons, then that's when you can consider other invasive rewarming. So one of the described methods is doing a thoracic lavage, uh, illustrated on the picture on the left. Sorry for the low quality of that picture. Uh, so you can do this with two chest tubes per side. So you want one chest tube anteriorly somewhere between the second or third intercostal space at the mid clavicular line. And that's where you want to pour in warm saline above 40 degrees Celsius. You can use a level one transfuser or something similar so that uh, you can speed up the process of infusing. And then you also want to have a posterior lateral chest tube around the mid axillary line in the fifth or sixth intercostal space so that the fluid can drain out via gravity once it's attached to a pleurovac. Another uh, method commonly described is peritoneal lavage or uh, peritoneal dialysis. And it seems like there's uh, many different ways to perform this uh, technique with different sources recommending different ones. And some sources even recommending not using it because of how invasive it is. But the most common method I saw was to place a peritoneal catheter either with direct incision or using cell donor technique. And then you can pour in 10 to 20 cc's per kilogram of uh, warm dialysate. Let it sit in that abdomen for about 20 minutes and then you can remove it. You can repeat this process over and over or you can put in two catheters so that one is infusing one and one is straining similar to you would do in thoracic lavage. And lastly uh, something a little more simple is uh, bladder irrigation with worm saline. So this table from New England Journal of Medicine indicates the effectiveness of rewarming techniques by Celsius per hour. And as you can see, ECMO and cardiopulmonary bypass are by far the most effective 
ranging anywhere between 4 to 9 degrees Celsius per hour. Not only that, but studies actually show that using ECMO or card cardiopulmonary bypass can reduce mortality in hypothermic arrest by as much as 40 to 90 percent, going from uh, a mortality of less than 30, uh, survivability of less than 37 percent to anywhere between 47 to 63 percent with ECMO or cardio cardiopulmonary bypass. The type of ECMO or cardiopulmonary bypass depends on center availability and ease of access because the time to it is critical. And so often whatever is available or easiest and fastest is the preferred because they're all effective. In general, starting from here, when I refer to ECMO, I'm going to be referring to whatever is available to the patient between a VV ECMO, VA ECMO, and cardiopulmonary bypass. Of the other invasive rewarding methods we discussed, uh, thoracic lavage is the, has the higher efficacy at about 3 degrees Celsius per hour, with uh, peritoneal being estimated to be about 1 to 3. Compared to ECMO uh, and cardiopulmonary by bypass, uh, the lavages have lower efficacy. They're also very labor intensive and have high risk of iatrogenic harm, as well as less evidence for uh, mortality. So that's why they're reserved only for when uh, ECMO and cardiopulmonary bypass are not options. This graph shows the rate of rewarming for patients uh, when they have various underlying illnesses. Uh, and you can see that underlying illnesses such as sepsis can severely slow the rate of rewarming. So it's important to have a high uh, index of suspicion for things like sepsis, sepsis if rewarming is not going as quickly as expected and have a low threshold to start antibiotics. So now to return to the case, after AK was extricated after being submerged for 25 minutes, uh, CPR was started on scene by paramedics and she was transferred to Victoria Hospitals. They actually achieved ROSC on the way uh, with just epinephrine. The first temperature obtained by rectal probe in a hospital was 27.9 degrees Celsius, and the primary survey did not reveal any immediately life-threatening injuries. She was intubated and uh, had peripheral and arterial lines inserted. And then she had a pan CT of the body, which only revealed undisplaced pelvic fractures. So she was placed in a pelvic binder and ortho was consulted. Uh, a CT of the head showed diffuse cerebral edema, so neurosurgery was consulted for prognostication and they started hypertonic saline. She rewarmed quite quickly with just the bear hugger and warm IV fluids and reached a temperature of about 32 degrees Celsius within a few hours. And her hypotension was fluid responsive and she remained otherwise stable, so ECMO did not need to be initiated. So not dead until warm and dead is a statement I've heard about hypothermia over and over, and it comes from experience and reports of hypothermic patients who make re remarkable recoveries uh, despite being seemingly at death's door. So there's a lot of case reports of such cases, but uh, one I wanna highlight is the abstract on the left. It's a 29-year-old female patient who got wedged between rocks and thick ice while skiing. She was submerged in ice water immediately, kind of like our patient. The companion she was with could not extricate her, and it took about 40 minutes for help to arrive and extricate her from the uh, submersion. At the hospital, she was found to be 13.7 degrees, and uh, she was rewarmed re with cardiopulmonary bypass. And by the time she was stable enough to be transferred to ICU, it had been about nine hours of resuscitation. Despite that, she made good physical and neurological recovery. There are many other similar case reports of prolonged hypothermic arrest patients surviving with good neurologic outcome. And some commonalities between the cases include a very young age, a lack of comorbidities, and quick cooling. So if you remember from our case, the patient had fixed dilated pupils and a cold stiff body upon extrication, but quickly achieved ROSC. Some signs we usually use to determine futility of resuscitation, such as fixed dilated pupils, areflexia, and what looks like rigor mortis are not really reliable in hypothermia. So then how should we determine uh, when to terminate resuscitation for hypothermic patients? Before I start, I want to preface this section by saying that this is an area that doesn't have much high quality data, such as randomized control trials. Uh, 
a lot of the recommendations are based on case reports, physiology, and expert opinion instead. So, of course, you would terminate resuscitation if there are obvious signs of irre irreversible death, such as the capitation or truncal transaction. Or if the patient is frozen solid to the point where you can't even com perform chest compressions. If a patient's temperature is over 32 degrees Celsius and they're still in cardiac arrest, then hypothermia is unlikely to be a, the main culprit. So at that point, you should consider um, termination as usual. If a patient has a history of witness arrest prior to hypothermia, then recovery is less likely because presumably whatever caused the arrest has been ongoing. And of course, usual considerations for termination should be used as well, such as downtime, cardiac standstill on focus, age, comorbidities, and other things. Something specifically used for termination in hypothermic patients is uh, serum potassium level. So not only is a high serum potassium level generally incompatible with life, but it also serves as a surrogate marker of cell death, as well as a surrogate marker to suggest that death happened before the hypothermia. The highest recorded uh, potassium levels in successfully resuscitated patients are seen on the left. So it's 11.8 millimoles per liter in a 31-month-old, and you can see the abstract for that crazy case on the right. In a 13-year-old, um, the highest was 9.5. There's a recorded 7.9 in a 34-year-old who survived. And then the highest in an avalanche patient is 6.4 millimoles per liter. So based on these numbers, potassium levels above 12 can be used for termination as uh, per all guidelines I've seen. In the 10 to 12 range is where it gets a little controversial, so you can uh, consider discussing with the ECMO team or the intensive care team. Uh, the European Resuscitation Council guidelines specifically suggest a cutoff of eight for avalanche survivors because of uh, the highest potassium, uh, potassium uh, being 6.4 in the past. Speaking of avalanches, there are uh, some specific guidelines around avalanche patients. Not that you know, we see many of them in this area of the world. Uh, so if a patient is buried in snow for more than 35 minutes and the airway is patent, then the arrest could be secondary to hypothermia, and this patient may benefit from reworming, such as ECMO. On the other hand, if the patient's airway is packed with snow, or if the patient is found within 35 minutes of burial and is already arrested, then resuscitation is less likely to be successful um, because the patient likely died either from hypoxia or other injuries rather than hypothermia. So for patients where drowning is the cause of hypothermia like our patients, we know that submersion uh, causing hypoxic arrest has a worse prognosis than immersion. Submersion uh, being that you're completely underwater, so it causes hypoxic arrest rather than immersion, which is when you're breathing prior to, um, prior to your body cools and goes into rest. Drowning in cold water is often described to have uh, better outcomes than warm water because of the cooling and neuroprotective effects. So ideally, unstable hypothermic patients or patients with a temperature less than 28 degrees on scene should be transported immediately to an ECMO-capable center from scene by EMS. But if the patient is already in a hospital without ECMO capabilities, then guidelines suggest uh, actually considering transport to an ECMO-capable center as long as the patient does not meet any criteria for termination of resuscitation and transport time is less than six hours. So the seemingly massive window of six hours is because of the significant mortality benefit from ECMO as we discussed earlier. So in, in, if you are in a center that's less than six hours away from an ECMO center, uh, you should consider communicating with the ECMO center before starting other invasive rewarming. If the patient is accepted in transfer, then while en route, you wanna continue the minimally invasive rewarming, such as bear hugger and uh, worm IV fluids. You also want to cover the patient, but you want to avoid direct heat to the patient's head because you want to keep the head cool for neurologic protection. If the patient is not accepted in transfer, you want to continue the resuscitation or you're very remote, 
more than six hours away, then this is the time where you should start other methods of rewarming, such as thoracic and uh, peritoneal lavage. American Heart Association guidelines suggest using the standard ACLS algorithm with shocks and drugs as per usual for hypothermic arrest concurrent with rewarming strategies. But a uh, problem uh, that comes up often is that defibrillation and resuscitation medications are less effective at lower temperatures. And even if you achieve ROSC, because of the significant hypothermia, a lot of these patients go back into BFib or BPAC while getting rewarmed. And the worry, of course, is that in a prolonged resuscitation, you'd be giving epi over and over again and uh, building up the levels to a ridiculously high. The European Resuscitation Council guidelines uh, actually are a little different. And they suggest that for patients where the temperature is less than 30 degrees, it would be reasonable to attempt three shocks. And if they're all ineffective, then defer further shocks until the patient's temperature is over 30 degrees. They also say it's reasonable to withhold epinephrine and other antiarrhythmic drugs until temperatures are over 30 degrees. And they also suggest doubling the intervals between the medications, for example, giving epi every six to 10 minutes rather than uh, three to five. A good middle ground uh, to take into consideration both guidelines could be to try three doses of medications and three shocks. And if it's ineffective, then wait until the temperature is around 30 degrees Celsius before trying shocks and medications again. Um, in hypothermic arrest, prolonged CPR may be necessary. Um, and this might be even more so if the transport is involved. And as Danielle discussed last week, this is one of the situations where mechanical CPR can be incredibly helpful especially in lower resource settings when you don't have enough people to do CPR for hours and hours. And in those settings, mechanical CPR also opens up uh, free hands to do other interventions such as getting lines, thoracic and peritoneal lavage, and other things that are necessary. If unfortunately you find yourself in a setting with limited personnel and no access to mechanical CPR, European Resuscitation Council actually has guidelines suggesting using intermittent CPR. The theory being that hypothermia decreases metabolic demand enough and that this allows hypothermic patients to tolerate cardiac arrest much longer while still maintaining favorable uh, neurologic outcomes. They recommend doing intermittent CPR, uh, five minutes of CPR with five minute breaks for patients under 28 degrees and then five minutes of CPR with 10 minute breaks for patients under 20 degrees. And these, recommendation, these recommendations are based on case reports of hypothermic patients in cardiac arrest, receiving delayed or intermittent CPR and still surviving with good neurologic outcomes. And also data from surgery where they use deep hypothermic uh, circulatory arrest in order to protect cerebral function during surgeries like aortic arch surgery when uh, cardiopulmonary bypass is not an option. Of course, if you have the resources available or you have mechanical CPR available, then continuous CPR is strongly preferred. But if you happen to be doing intermittent CPR, this would also uh, be a good time to do things like prep and start thoracic or peritoneal lavage, because presumably you're going to be in a resource strain setting where ECMO may not be available. Uh, and here I wanted to talk briefly about hypothermia and urban EDs because most of the patients we see that are hypothermic aren't buried in avalanches or drowning in cold water. They're more off, it's more often secondary to impaired ability to find shelter, such as homelessness and impaired mobility, or because of an impaired ability to thermoregulate because of an underlying illness. So mortality is therefore more associated with underlying illness than the temperature. And given the high incidence of underlying illness, it's important that we identify and treat these early. In particular, uh, have a low threshold to start empiric antibiotics as infection is a very common cause of hypothermia. So finally, for case resolution, uh, to wrap it up, AK ended up with fairly minimal traumatic injuries. The pelvic fractures that we saw in CT were uh, non-displaced and non-operative. So she was placed 
uh, she was able to start uh, doing protected weight bearing quite quickly. Her case was primarily a hypoxic hypothermic arrest secondary to submersion, which as we discussed earlier, carries a worse prognosis than immersion. However, thankfully she was able to make a remarkable recovery after just a few weeks in ICU and she was discharged with only very mild cognitive deficits. So this is actually a case that was covered by the London Free Press in a series of videos titled 27 Minutes. It was uh, really well done and it's kind of, it was pretty awesome to see the amazing recovery she made. And the video has the first responders and her family kind of recounting the experience. The picture on the right is a picture from a few years after the incident where uh, the patient is surrounded by first responders who are on the scene. Okay, and to finish up with take home points, the main take home points are uh, that stable hypothermic patients can be rewarmed with non-invasive or minimally invasive methods. If the patient is unstable or their temperature is less than 24 degrees, then they should be considered uh, for ECMO or cardiopulmonary bypass. The considerations for hypothermic specific indications for termination of resuscitation uh, should be considered. And this includes things like temperature above 32 degrees, a potassium level greater than 12, and the timing of the arrest compared to the cooling. In an arrest, if you find that three defibrillations and three doses of uh, epi and other resuscitation medications are ineffective, consider waiting until the temperature is above 30 degrees to give more. And lastly, in resource deplete settings, you can consider intermittent CPR. Okay, uh, these are my references. Uh, thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to speak today. That concludes my presentation. David, it's John Dreyer. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add one comment, uh, and that is, uh, as a, uh, uh, a northern temperate uh, country, uh, we tend to think of hypothermia as being um, something that occurs in winter, um, and you know, avalanches, cold water immersion, as you've described in this particular case. Uh, but in reality, it's actually also quite common in, um, uh, at warmer times of the year. Um, because when you think about it, body temperature being 37, uh, ambient temperature is often significantly lower than 37, thank goodness. Um, and when people are out, uh, commonly that would occur, people are out hiking, um, on a nice sunny day uh, and all they have is a t-shirt and shorts and all of a sudden the weather changes, uh, it starts raining, now you've got the additional cooling effect of evaporation uh, and very quickly people can become hypothermic and actually die. Uh, so in countries like New Zealand, um, unfortunately this happens usually to a North American hiker or two uh, every year or every other year. Uh, one or two people die of hypothermia, and it's exactly that. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, a country that's completely surrounded by ocean, obviously. Um, the weather can change. Um, the temperature can drop, you know, 10 degrees in, uh, in half an hour uh, when the wind changes to come out of the, the south, which is obviously coming from Antarctica. Um, uh, rain starts, and again, people have gone off hiking thinking it's a lovely warm summer day. Uh, and very quickly they become hypothermic uh, without any cover, uh, any warm clothes to put on. Uh, so it, it's, as I say, just you have to think about it at other times of the year than just in the middle of February when it, it's obvious and comes to mind. Yeah, thank you very much for the insights. That's very, very helpful. You got a quiet group this morning. <laughs> uh, good morning, David. It's Carl. Can, 
Hi, how are you? Good. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I would just want to draw your attention to the, the option of hemodialysis um, for sort of severe, moderate to severe non-arrested hypothermia. Um, there's been a recent review of that back in 2019 of the literature in a number of cases and, and myself and a couple of the intensivists um, uh, published a case report back in 2009 in CGEM on the topic. Um, and as you pointed out, a lot of centers don't have ECMO capability, but most of them do have hemodialysis capacity. Uh, so it's much more widely available and easier to institute. So um, I'm wondering if you'd had any comments on that or if you'd come across that literature. Uh, so I didn't come across that literature specifically, but in some of the reviews, it does mention it as an option that can rewarm anywhere between two to four degrees. Celsius degrees uh, yes. per hour. And so it's better than most of the other interventions except for ECMO and cardiopulmonary bypass. And like you mentioned, I imagine it would be a great option for the centers without those capabilities. Yeah, exactly. So that, that was the point that the, the rewarming um, is actually quite reasonable. Yeah. Uh, and all you need to do is place a dialysis catheter, which, um, you know, in centers that have that capacity, that's easy to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, which is also probably a lot less invasive than the thoracic lavage or peritoneal lavage. So, yeah, exactly, exactly, um, and it avoids the sort of transport transport to an ECMO center and somebody who's severe or arrested. You would imagine logistically is extremely yeah, yeah. difficult. Uh, yeah, so you might just want to update your um, your literature with that. As I said, there's a I think it's 2019, if I recall. Okay, there's yeah. a good uh, review of the current literature on the topic. Sounds great, thank you. Thanks, Dave. There's a follow-up question to that. Um, I believe it was in Windsor a while ago. I had actually made the suggestion for a hypothermic patient that we contact uh, a nephro and, and do dialysis for rewarming because we don't have ECMO. Um, but the, the nephro was, had never done that and wasn't very interested in trying something new. How do you convince people who have not done this before that it's a reasonable thing to do when they think of dialysis or or um, CRRT as being just for toxins and the usual indications. So like, how would you go about uh, in a peripheral center saying to them, yeah, we, we can do this, it'll work, it's been done elsewhere in the moment? Uh, if, I, if I can just uh, uh, make a comment on that and, and others can comment as well, but I think the approach to this is to do this beforehand. So I think the thing is to do when everyone's rested and uh, there's not a patient at risk is to just have a meeting with your nephrologists uh, and the Department of Emergency Medicine says, hey, you know, if this comes up, is this an option? Pre-circulate the literature, have a discussion what the protocol would look like and get people comfortable with this is an option. Um, I, would, I would think that's probably the way to go. Okay, thanks. Has, uh, it's Roy here. Has anybody um, done this at, uh, at our center, had approached nephrology for a hypothermic patient for hemodialysis and, and actually carried it through? Uh, so Roy, we actually did this at LHSC. Um, as I said, we published a case report in 2009 in, in CGEM. Uh, on a case of um, a gentleman who was brought into South Street, or into uh, Vic, uh, who was in non-arrested severe hypothermia. And our nephrologists actually were pretty keen to do it. Um, and it, the case report describes the outcome, but it was very positive. Good. Yeah. 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 Certainly yeah. Okay, so I guess if there's no further questions, then that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming and the questions and comments. Thanks, David. Great Thanks, talk. David.
Thanks, David.